a modern myth or physical reality. The being had these very large black eyes, luminous, not luminous, I don't mean that, I mean they didn't shine, but they were shiny in the sense that they reflected light, uh, big black, like they were balls of black liquid. Grey, small, uh, about three foot high, with great black eyes. You can't really see the mouths. You sort of see, you know, there's a nose there, but there isn't a nose there. They're ugly. They're grey in colour, light to dark, dark, dark grey. Their bodies are incredibly thin and small in comparison to their large heads. And they're, they're just they're scary. Last year, a poll claimed that almost four million Americans are the victims of alien abduction. Around the world, thousands of people have come forward to describe an experience that is consistent and terrifying. They say that their captors are an alien race called the Greys. The stories have caught the media's imagination and sparked a growing public controversy. to the States to investigate the pole and alien abductions. I don't know quite what I expected to find. I didn't know much about the claims or what people had experienced. I've been investigating the paranormal for 20 years now. I've studied telepathy and clairvoyance, out-of-body and near-death experiences, ghosts and poltergeists, but in all that time I've never really found anything that convinced me there was anything paranormal going on. I was laying there and just before I'd fallen asleep, off to the right hand side of me, off to the edge of my bed was a little white, it was a very bright white flash of light that went off. And then we proceed, almost always, to go into the light and the light kind of acts as a source of energy to take us to that crowd. And I saw three beings walking out of the field towards me. Um, they were very frightening. They were kind of walking in lockstep. They were small gray creatures wearing um, like blue cloaks or robes. At that point, something caught my attention um, on the other side of the field and I turned and I saw another being, which when I made eye contact with it, all the fear went away immediately. It was the most intense emotions that I've ever felt at any time in my life. No, um big speeches, hi, we're here to save you, or, you know, what, take me to your leader, or anything like that at all. It was just very uh, rudimentary kind of, um, kind of thing you'd say to an animal, to veterinarians. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. This will only take a little while. Relax, this is going to be over soon. The most extraordinary claim is that the Greys are conducting a hybrid breeding experiment with their prisoners. I immediately shut my eyes and thought, oh God, and I started getting very scared. And then the next thing that followed after that was that my legs were being spread apart. And then I, I really started to panic. And then the next thing I felt after that was this most incredible pain that I've ever felt in my life. And that felt like a bullet shot up into my uterus and hit the top of my uterus. And I screamed so hard. Sometimes you can see the fears being removed and taken away to be put into the columns. Most times I just know it's happening. Though from my vantage point on the table with my legs in the air, I can't see too awful much about what's going on or describe in detail how they do it. In like little glass boxes, I've seen these babies. Their bodies are very, very tiny. They look very thin and emaciated almost. And they're very quiet and they don't move. And it's almost a very sad picture for some reason. And there's again the mist and the light 
and we kind of just we just go out, follow the light, and then we're taken back and and put exactly where we were when we left. If I was sitting up reading a book, I'm put back sitting up reading a book. I don't care for them much. I don't care for their intrusion in my family and my life. I don't like that at all. I don't like them at all. <laughs> I suppose from the outset, three possible explanations present themselves. One, that people are just making it up, it's some kind of invention or hoax. Two, that it's real, there are aliens out there actually abducting people and they're describing a truthful experience. Or three, they're interpreting as an abduction some mental experience produced by their brain. What's particularly striking about the abduction stories is how consistent they are. People report the same kind of experience again and again. Now this could be because they've all met the same kind of alien, or it could be because similar things are going on in their brains. Bud Hopkins' book, Missing Time, was a key event. People who had periods of missing time, when they couldn't remember what had happened to them, began to go to therapists and ask to be hypnotized to see if they could find out what had happened. And lo and behold, lots of accounts of abduction experiences were recovered. Bud is one of the designers of the poll that made those extraordinary claims about nearly four million Americans being abductees. He's come across abductees from all walks of life. I have worked now with, uh, I've had seven psychiatrists come to me because of their own personal abduction experiences. I've had probably 10 or 12 police officers. I had a full colonel in the army recently. I had a NASA scientist. I've had people who were prominent in show business and in, uh, just plain folk, children, adults, and so forth. Uh, people from all racial, ethnic backgrounds, uh, virtually a cross-section. And these people are all very frightened, traumatized, confused, wondering, am I crazy? What's the matter? How can this be real? Hoping it isn't real. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any particular pattern to the uh, reason these people have been selected. How many people are we talking about altogether? Well, I have worked myself in total numbers with uh, probably 450 or so abductees. That's in depth with these people over the years. This is a problem because it makes me wonder whether the stories have been created by public knowledge about aliens and hypnotists implanting the ideas. To reassure me, Bud invited me to watch the hypnosis of a young man. It was his first session. Mark had come to him quite nervous. He'd had some experiences when he was a teenager, when he was asleep in bed, and he couldn't really remember what had happened. I think Mark was hoping that when he came to Bud, the hypnosis would bring back memories and perhaps help him to cope with it. Maybe it's just a vague sense, whether it's a big stocky person or a medium-sized person, whether it's a child, whether it's a man or a woman, you might get some sense. So After 30 minutes of careful and gentle questions, Mark identified his tormentors. Two, you're about to open your eyelids just a tiny bit and look. Three, closing your eyelids. Yeah, it looks like one of them. What do you mean, one of them? I'm gray. So what do you think's going on? You're implying all the time this is real. The person actually went out there. Something actually came physically into the room, into the world. What do you think's really going on? You know, well, I'm not saying that happens in every single case that comes our way. We, we reject some cases, and some cases seem to have be cloudy. But in the cases that check out, which is the vast majority, there seems to be some kind of non-human intelligence which is interacting with us and which possesses some kind of technological equipment which is way advanced over ours. We do not know, ultimately, what this will mean. We have had two basic science fiction myths about ultimate contact with another kind of intelligence. Either they're going to be body snatchers, invaders from Mars, come to do us in, or they're going to be these wonderfully benign, helpful people here to help you with the ozone layer. We have gotten no evidence whatsoever that either of those two um, explanations fits. What does seem to fit is that whoever they are, they are here for their purposes with their agenda. And they are trying to do this, it would seem, with a minimum of disruption of the lives of the people who are the involuntary specimen that they're dealing with. Some people have more than one experience. They have multiple abductions. This often starts when they're very young, in early childhood. They can get taken by the aliens many, many times. I've had pretty regular visits. They used to be very sporadic and maybe once or twice a year. 
and about the 1989-90 time frame they got to be more regular. Mary's bedroom walls are covered with drawings of the greys. Have these helped create vivid dreams? I, I don't believe that the experience of having an interaction with these extraterrestrial beings and dream state is anything similar at all. In the dream state, it's, it's really more of sort of a constant flow and the, the state of consciousness when you're awake is quite um, vivid to, to people and they definitely know what they're perceiving and what they're seeing and what they're hearing. And when you interact with these beings, you know what you're seeing, you know what you're hearing. And it just, there's, there's no way that you can confuse the two. I work in the defense industry and I have a very mainstream nine to five conservative job. And I am not a person that most people would suspect this is happening to. I think a lot of people feel that individuals who claim to be abducted are people living in some backwoods society that, you know, are just having some type of a mental illness of some kind. And I think it's important for people to know that the average responsible, highly functioning adult person in the society is having these experiences. I think it's obvious that these people are not hoaxers. Something really did happen to them. But I can't accept that an alien race could wipe out our memories, but we could still manage to recover them so easily. On the other hand, the stories I've heard sound so convincing, and the abductees seem so plausible. And there are many people who believe their stories. Amongst them is one of America's best-known psychiatrists, John Mack. When I first heard uh, that there was an artist in New York named Bud Hopkins who took seriously the stories of people who reported being taken by alien beings into spacecraft, I thought he must be mad and he's talking about some new form of psychosis. But these people, as far as I could tell, were of sound mind, had not communicated with each other, were not getting details from the media. This was long before the great media rash of information on this subject. They were reluctant to come forth and they described similar stories in great detail and were shocked when they would hear that someone else had had a similar experience. And the only thing as a psychiatrist that I knew that behaved like that was real experience. John, you have a very high profile and the fact that you're a professor at Harvard tends to make people believe you. I mean, do you think you could be seriously misleading people about what's going on here? What are the other possibilities? Dreams, for instance. Dreams do not behave like that. Dreams are highly individual. One dreams according to what's going on in your unconscious at that particular time and the dreams of one person are quite different from those of another uh, or uh, some other some kind of trauma for instance like sexual abuse which is often raised uh, creating a story which replicates your abuse story the replicated story is very similar to the original abuse frightened of men entering your room but it's vague it's general you don't have a highly complex narrative of an altogether different sort I, I would never say, yes, there are aliens taking people. I would say there is a compelling, powerful phenomenon here that I can't account for in any other way that's mysterious. There isn't a single case of an alien abduction story that fulfills my criteria that has turned out to be anything else. And yet I can't know what it is. But, but it seems to me it invites some kind of deeper, further inquiry. The first psychological study of abductees has been done at Carleton University, Ottawa. John Mack can perhaps afford to leave a question like, do aliens really exist, hanging in the air? But as a psychologist, it's my job to answer that question. First of all, are they mentally ill? Well, there's a stereotype out there that uh, they're crazy people or social marginals, um, undereducated people, that kind of thing. And is that true? No, it's not true. It's not true. Well, what we did was we actually placed ads in the newspaper asking for people who had had any kind of UFO experiences. And uh, some of them were uh, abductees, some of them had seen lights in the sky or had other experiences of um, something that they termed to be a UFO or aliens. Uh, we interviewed them, this is one-on-one, -on -one. I did all the interviews, um, and uh, asked them about their experiences, you know, got as much detail as we could from them, and then we uh, administered a battery of uh, questionnaires um, that are supposed to assess things like mental illness, well-being, fantasy proneness, IQ, so we gave them a whole slew of things. Um, we, we found that um, they went to university, you know, intelligent people with children and families and lives. Um, we did find differences on measures of fantasy proneness, imagery, uh, that kind of thing. Does that lead you to think that the, those abduction experiences are just a question of fantasy? Uh, no. We're talking about normal people who have a relatively higher propensity um, for imagery and fantasy and that kind of thing.
So, these people are not mad, and they're not just inventing a fantasy. But perhaps if something strange happens in their brain, they might be more able to invent a vivid story than the rest of us would. There's been a lot of criticism of researchers like Bud Hopkins and John Mack on the grounds that they could be implanting the stories in the abductees as false memories. It's quite possible by hypnotizing somebody or even just by relaxing them or asking them the same question again and again to get them to invent a story as though it was something from a past. And then after that, they'll remember it as vividly as they remember things that really did happen. I showed Mark's tape to an expert on false memory syndrome. I still feel scared. Well, what do you think of this hypnotic technique being used here? Well, you just have to be so careful with hypnosis because it is a sort of chameleon. It uh, has this nasty habit of uh, uh, people giving you, if you like, what they perceive you want. Uh, this guy appears to be quite responsive. When he's uh, being regressed, he speaks in the present tense, which is usually a tip-off that they're experiencing something immediately in the here and now. Uh, he's also... Uh, there's one point I thought that there might be something that's known as translogic, where he said he's going through the floor and that it's his father, his parents' room, but it feels like his sister's room in this sort of... You mean the kind of incompatibility, a sort of logic sort of, that you couldn't have in waking Sort of life. mixing fantasy and reality with no sense of there being any logical incongruity. You see the uh, walls in the bed there? I see the walls in the bed, but I feel higher now than that. Mm -hmm. I feel like... I must feel like I've gone through the, floor, the ceiling. Mm -hmm. My own feeling is that uh, most of the work has been done before hypnosis even started. Bud helped to design this questionnaire, which is meant to identify the people who may be abductees. He's also trying to warn them that there are some dangers that lie ahead in being hypnotized, in revealing an abduction in their past. Well, the questionnaire is a quite interesting one. Uh, for one thing, it has a number of items on it about uh, the paranormal. Have you ever had a religious vision? Uh, uh, have you ever seen or sensed the presence of a ghost? Uh, has a deceased relative or friend ever visited you home in the night? We know that uh, there is a quite reasonably robust correlation between belief in the paranormal and the ability to be hypnotised. Having filled out the questionnaire, mm -hmm. uh, now I've given some uh, preparation as to what to expect. And we're told, well, the UFO is very scary, and further, hypnosis is a very scary experience. But isn't uh, that just a sort of kind warning, so that they will not go into it um, unprepared? Well, it seems to be emphasising it a little bit more than we ordinarily do. Well, certainly, mm. in fact, it says here, you may finally come to see yourself correctly as a much stronger person than before, and as a survivor. So, he sort of setting it up that only uh, brave bungee jumpers do hypnosis. <laughs> and you mean if you're not prepared to go through with it? Well, it means you're a whip. I feel like I'm not in control. Don't most of us believe that we can really tell the difference between our memories and our imagination? I guess most of us believe it, but in fact it's not necessarily what happens. Uh, the thing about memory that you've got to realise is that Memory is not like a videotape recorder. It's constantly being reconstructed in the light of uh, fresh inputs. And as you know, the event uh, gets more and more distant in time, uh, what you think may be a true memory of what happened may actually be a fantasy of what happened or what somebody else told you that happened. And you've got to realise that you're using a very fallible technique and it's one that does not guarantee biblical truth. We're going to go back. This is a very good example of how simple it is to create false memories. You only have to relax someone, and if they have the right expectations, it's very easy for them to invent all sorts of vivid experiences, especially if they're the sort of person who has good imagery in the first place. All kinds of paranormal experiences can be created. Marianne is not an abductee. 
She's being regressed to a previous incarnation, a prior life. Getting younger and younger. Two. One. And zero. I didn't do very much. In fact, it's, it's even more interesting in, in Marianne's case because she doesn't have this earlier prior belief in the reality of prior life. It's, it would be even easier with someone with, who comes in with a positive belief. In her case, I only know that she's a high hypnotizable subject, that she has very good imagery ability. She's able to become very much absorbed into the internal images that she creates. So I just give her the occasion to do so. I was falling. You were falling? Mm. I fell off a tree. You fell off a tree? Are you okay? Yeah, but it scared the heck out of me. At first, when he mentioned that we're going back in time, everything goes kind of blank. And it, for me, it went kind of blank. And then yeah. it was like I, I was traveling very, very fast, like a small bullet. And how old are you? About eight. What's your name? Cliff. Clifford. Clifford. Well, I was a, a eight-year-old boy, and I felt I was a bad little boy. And just at the moment when uh, Jean Roc said, "Okay, we're going to come back," I was starting to feel a little nauseated, and I think I was on my way to mischief. I don't know why. It was just a feeling that I had. And tell me, I, this may be a difficult question for a little boy of eight, but do you know what year it is? 1750-something. Okay. The memory that I have of this past life is just as vivid as my other memories, just as real. And I, I would even say, well, because it's fresh right now, it's very, very intense. There are many, many similarities between whether you're talking about uh, ritual sexual abuse and creation, uh, past life regressions like we did, or even uh, extraterrestrial abductions and kidnappings. Uh, all of these memories are reconstructed in the same way. Uh, except if you can independently co corroborate these memories, there are no way to differentiate them. Uh, if you take the case, for example, of a uh, ET kidnapping, well, usually a person will come in with one experience that, that surprised them. And then they will be hypnotized and slowly and gradually over repetitive testing and recalls the, the memory will take shape and it will become more detailed and will, will also take reality value. It's the same thing that we just did here. If I was to re-hypnotize Marianne repetitively going back to the same life, then she would start having a much larger history, richer history of that life and it would for her then be even more difficult to differentiate between reality and fiction. Where are you? I'm in the countryside. Studies show very clearly that what hypnosis does is that it increases productivity. It makes you talk more, but most of it's error. Hypnosis is the biggest red herring in this one could possibly imagine. Even more important than that is the fact that we have hundreds of abduction accounts remembered without hypnosis. Hypnosis is only useful to help flesh things out and everybody remembers pieces of the experiences to begin with at the minimum But I have numerous cases which, where people remember the whole thing from beginning to end without hypnosis This is not heavy evidence of anything. This was really for him. This was for him to kind of ventilate <clears throat> Some experiences he was having the cases that have a lot of weight as evidence are ones in which there are other witnesses or physical marks there's all kinds of uh, physical sequelae which accompany the experience i have always gone to uh, cases where there was more physical evidence and uh, more witnesses i think that's the point if one case or ten cases are valid because of the number of witnesses the number of physical evidence uh, the numbers of points of view that are involved in it uh, and those are valid then a case like this can very easily be valid too, even though it doesn't have that weight of evidence. The trouble with the scars is that they could have come about in any way. They are interesting, but I couldn't say that they were done by aliens. 
and nor can any doctor. David Jacobs is author of a book containing the most detailed accounts of abduction experiences and also a co-designer of the pole. People will describe an object being inserted by a needle-like device way up their nose. They hear a crunching sound as it passes the cartilage. It goes all the way up, we think, towards the pituitary gland. Then the instrument is removed and the little BB or ball-like object on the end of it is gone. How come we haven't got any of those implants and can't see them? Well, of course, we've, we've known about this for quite a while. Uh, we've come close, I must say, many times. Uh, we've had about 20 cases where people have sneezed these out or blown them out of their nose in some way. Each time they did not realize that they had been involved with the abduction phenomenon and thought they'd inhaled something and thrown it away or put it away for safekeeping and over the years they got lost. In the CAT scans and MRIs that we have had, what will appear will be a little white, let's just say, density on the film surface. Now that density could immediately could, goes into debate right away. It could be an artifact from space, it could be a calcium deposit, it could be anything. The only way you can find out for sure is actually operating and literally opening up their skull and looking at it. White spots on scans are not exceptionally rare. They're seen in many clinical cases. We do have other forms of physical evidence. Uh, one of the things that I first noticed years ago was that people were returning uh, from these events with unusual stains on their clothes that uh, seemed to make no sense. Uh, clothes, uh, stains on their underwear, on their night clothes, or whatever they were wearing to bed. Uh, we sort of know how they got these stains. Uh, here, are, here are some of the stains. Uh, if you can see this here and this here. Yeah, no, this is an odd one here. Mm -hmm. yes. So what, what do you think is happening? How are they getting well, these? Well, when they're laying on the table, uh, sometimes these beings will uh, use a solution on their body. We think for neurological testing. We're not exactly sure of that, but the evidence seems to, seems to suggest that. But the stains are unusual, and we've had them analyzed by a number of different laboratories now. And what you get is just sort of odd combinations of substances. Uh, there might be some uh, uh, nitrogen, there might be some sodium, there might be some... Uh, well, oh, various different chemical substances, none of which prove that this is something alien, for example. And you don't think there's some way they could be trying to make their stories more plausible by going home and pouring cleaning solution or something? Well, I place. suppose that that's always possible. Uh, the people who come to me are very, very sincere and very distressed and very worried about what's happening to them and worried about their families. And, and most of these people uh, hope that it had never, wish it had never happened in the first place and hope that it never happens again. No objects of alien origin have ever been identified. The problem is that people want the evidence to be more convincing than it is. But everything you see and everything you hear is coloured by what you expect to be there. Listen to this tape. I tape record in my room every night. I've been doing it for about two years. You can hear three words, and the three words are, don't wake up. It would change things completely for me if there were convincing hard evidence. But there really isn't any solid corroboration. But what about the small number of abductees who don't need hypnosis or therapy? They wake with full recall of their experiences. I wonder if psychology can still explain this. Could the abductees be reinterpreting some other experience using cultural influences from the 20th century? Hardly anyone alive in North America now, or in most of Europe, can have failed to have seen science fiction movies, E.T., Close Encounters, all sorts of images of aliens. They're part of our culture. I've come across many other kinds of paranormal experience in which people have a strong story and detailed descriptions, such as when they come near death and go to heaven and describe green fields and brightly coloured flowers. But the strongest echoes I hear in the abductee stories are of a familiar experience, sleep paralysis. This can happen not just when you're asleep, but when you're driving along, when you're exhausted or under stress or very tired. Bright lights can trigger it too. Sleep paralysis has happened to me. It's essential for dreaming that our bodily muscles are paralyzed so that we don't act out our dreams. Usually this happens when we're fast asleep, but just sometimes the mechanism goes wrong and we're still awake while the body's paralyzed. It's a terrifying experience. You're asleep, but you're awake. You're paralyzed and you don't know why. You feel as if you can't breathe. And sometimes there's a sense of presence, 
a feeling that there's someone there, even if you can't see them. Surveys show that about a quarter of all people have had sleep paralysis, and of these, 85% had a sense of presence. But that presence is interpreted in different ways in different cultures. For example, the grey ghost appears in the jungles of Southeast Asia, and it's even travelled to the United States with the Hmong people, refugees from Laos. You cannot move at that time. You cannot even turn in, even move your hand or leg or body. Just come and press on your chest and take off. <laughs> and then uh, sit on, on top of your body. Huh? Sometimes you wake up after that ghost left. But sometimes make you deep sleep. Do you have any idea why it picked on you? I have no idea. <laughs> You've not done something terrible? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And how many times has it happened to you altogether? I I could not count when I was <laughs> a young young man in my country, but it happened to me in Philadelphia here. Mm -hmm. Does it still happen to you? Not about five years ago, um, because I have the picture of Jesus Christ hang on the wall, and then since then never happened to me. In Newfoundland, Canada, the old hag appears as a dark, menacing figure and tries to strangle victims of sleep paralysis. People weren't a bit shy or embarrassed about the old hag. In fact, they were quite willing to talk about their experiences if you brought them a pint or two. At one time I saw an old woman with a black cape and I don't know if that's just because I had heard that's what the old hag was. She sits on your chest and squashes you. She stops you breathing. Just whoosh, these two things came up in front of my face, and it was like a, a swirly black gray mass. It was all this weight, and just couldn't move, couldn't breathe, just couldn't do anything at all. Her victims are always paralyzed. And my mind is awake, and my body won't move. And I want to wake up, I want to scream. I try to scream, and right nothing comes out. Nothing at all. Now I can look around. Can you look around yeah. with your eyes? Yeah. Oh, your eyes oh, my eyes open? are open, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've had oh, the old hag. Uh, I've seen like my mother walk in the room and walk out. And I've had the old hag, oh, and she has. Yeah. And, yes, and she goes downstairs and like she'll yell to me, Fred, you know, supper is ready. Hello. I'm there like, uh, yeah, sure it is, but <laughs> bad time, ma'am. <laughs> So did the first psychological study find sleep paralysis under the technological gloss of alien abductions? I think it was about 25% of um, the intense experiences um, that seemed to be actually explanations or descriptions of episodes of sleep paralysis. What was the description they gave? Uh, well, typically that they were uh, in their beds, uh, woke up in the middle of the night, found they were unable to move, frequently uh, described a feeling of being pushed down or held down by some unseen force. The standard description focused on the eyes as being very big, very dark. So what should I make of the poll? Conducted by the respected Roper organization, it was a telephone survey of 5,947 Americans and asked a range of questions supposed to identify potential abductees. The poll itself was well carried out, but what I don't understand is how you jump from a few simple questions that don't seem to be about abductions to the conclusion that someone has been abducted. Tell me what you think about the conclusions of the Roper poll. Well, the Roper poll has indicated to us uh, that there are about 5 million Americans who have had experiences that are consistent with the experiences that abductees have had before they understood that they were involved with the abduction phenomenon, before they knew they were abductees. Uh, at the very least, it's told us that there's an awful lot of potential abductees out there, maybe even millions. Isn't there a danger that these are just perfectly normal experiences and that you're almost persuading people that they must have been abducted and right. causing well, panic and fear? Well, we know that the vast majority of people, that is maybe 80 to 85 percent of everybody, have never had any unusual experiences of the sort that I'm talking about at all. What is normal is not having these experiences, and we know that for an absolute fact. David Jacobs couldn't be more wrong. In fact, the majority of people have had some kind of unusual experience. I don't think the poll tells us anything specific about abductions at all. 
All the events described in it happen to people when they have sleep paralysis and other perfectly explicable experiences. But there's still something missing here. I can't quite see why there's this strong sense of feeling pulled from the body, of flying up into the spaceship, of being prodded by aliens. Sleep paralysis can get us so far, but I don't think it can explain the whole experience. It doesn't, for example, have the familiar journey, being taken out of the bedroom and far away. Nor does it have the sexual aspects, which are so common amongst abductees. But these do appear in ancient myths, such as the incubus and succubus, demons who come along in the night and have sexual intercourse with people against their will. Their purpose is to produce half-devil, half-human babies. The similarities with abductions are obvious. Then there are the fairy abduction myths, where people are taken away or babies replaced by changelings. Most people in our culture have probably heard of one or other of these stories, and hypnosis and relaxation are just the times when these deep tales are going to surface. I suspect there's a common experience underlying these myths and alien abductions. Again, it's to be found in the brain. Actually, this is my son, Jolien, <laughs> and I can use him to, to demonstrate what might be an explanation of abduction experiences. Here, either side of the, the head, are the temporal lobes of the brain. Well known because in temporal lobe epileptics, this is where the focus is of, of the problem that they have. But what's less well known is that everybody has a lot of activity going on in these parts of the brain, which can induce experiences of floating and flying, mystical experiences and so on. All the time, most of the brain is active, but parts being used at any time are more active than others. And each part of the brain consists of lots of cells, millions of cells, in fact, interconnected. Some are exciting other cells, some are inhibiting others. It's very easy to see that activity here can be producing hallucinations and strange experiences, which might account for abduction experiences. Creative, artistic individuals are especially susceptible to temporal lobe seizures. These misfirings can be common, but are normally very mild. They can happen without warning and are very hard to study. And so one scientist has resorted to an artificial means of creating them. The chamber of Professor Michael Persinger. Okay, I'm just going to put these on the back of your hand. In here, he has stimulated the temporal lobes of many volunteers, producing strange experiences. I was to be his next guinea pig. Is it too tight? No, that's fine. The, uh, the helmet is a, a modified motorcycle helmet, uh, within which are embedded solenoids on both sides. The magnetic field is generated across the temporal parietal area. We can control the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere. This particular experiment will be both hemispheres stimulated. Effectively, the brain works on electromagnetic patterns. In the past, the experimental patterns have been really simple, and hence the effects have been almost non-existent. What we have done with computer technology is generate complicated fields that imitate what the brain does, so we can talk to the brain. But effectively, we can generate patterns which imitate the basic sequences of the fundamental processes that have to do with memory, perception, and general experiences. Do you mean that you could at least in principle, with a system like this, give someone a precise kind of hallucination? Uh, technically, it would be called a hallucination because you're directly stimulating the brain, as opposed to going through the traditional senses. We'd have to be very cautious, and one should always be cautious, because the minute you force the brain to do something, you risk the possibility of seizures. What's that? Is that comfortable? Yes, it's Are fine. Your, your ears aren't squished or anything? No. Okay. The experiences that are generated experimentally are primarily the fragments of abduction-type experiences and mystical-type experiences, and even the beginning of some kinds of psychical or often near-death-like experiences. So pleasant vibrations, feeling being light leaving the body, perhaps a sense of a presence. Uh, also uh, sensations that involve visual experiences, the feeling that it's a dream, but it's more intense than a dream. Uh, very often the feelings of an altered reality, feeling that the self is detached from the body. And sometimes sexual arousal occurs, uh, which is a very important feature because we find that many of these patterns are very like, very much like the incubi 
and Sukhoi reports of previous centuries where people felt a sexual arousal at the time when the entity was visiting them. Hmm, well I didn't really fancy the idea of being molested by an apparition. Okay, Dr. Blackmore, would you like to uh, close your eyes and keep them closed, please? I'm walking again. Oh, but, but this time it's a little different. Oh, yeah. It's as though something's got hold of my left leg. If somebody says that they've experienced a spiritual entity, but they're on a psychiatric ward, you're likely to say they're crazy. But if they have the exact experience and they're in a church pew, you're more likely to say it's real. The context determines your explanations for really mundane events. And I'm just floating again. Floating again. I'm frightened. I, this is this is odd. I, I don't know what I'm frightened about. I'm really scared. Dr. Blackmore, I'm coming in now, okay? Oh, it's much later. <laughs> that was very interesting. In the first, well, of course, the time's a bit strange, but in, in the first few minutes, I was sort of thinking, well, is anything happening? And ought I to say anything? And then suddenly, pfft, it was perfectly obvious this wasn't as I've normally been in rooms like mm -hmm. this and had interesting visual images. It wasn't like that at all. Persinger has come across some curious alien abduction cases that he suspects were really episodes of temporal lobe seizure, those linked to glowing balls of light, UFOs. Our data indicate that for some of the more well-known cases, such as Travis Walton and some of the classic ones where there was a ball of light either directly observed or recalled or other people saw it and the person came close to the ball of light and suddenly they had a seizure-like effect where they were knocked unconscious or they had tingling sensations yes that's a direct impact on the brain and very often when these individuals woke up which they often did after a few minutes sometimes two or three days not that they were asleep but they were amnesic they experienced or reported an abduction scenario in the late 1960s I became interested in why certain kinds of phenomena are left out of science luminous phenomena were one of them called UFOs and so I began to look at about four or five thousand of these events so I codified them and put them on computer and began to determine if there were any kind of energetic sources that could explain these unusual things my assumption was that it would require tremendous energy to produce these real oddities of the space-time fabric uh, earthquakes was one candidate at least the energy associated with earthquakes and Actually, I didn't do anything. I have to thank the computer because when the analysis first came out, it became very clear that what were called luminous phenomena in the last century were highly correlated with earthquakes and that these phenomena occurred weeks to months before earthquakes. When I applied the same formula to the contemporary setting, those phenomena were called UFOs, unidentified flying objects, most of them being luminous balls of light. Film shows the electrical discharges released when rock is crushed under pressure an event likely to happen in the build-up to even minor earthquakes. Persinger suspects that these lights might also emit the electromagnetic waves that cause temporal lobe hallucinations. Apparitional phenomena preceding earthquakes are really quite common. The large earthquakes that have struck in Quebec and parts of British Columbia, there are a lot of historical data about, have reported uh, apparitions and very often it was framed in the beliefs of the time i.e. the graves had opened up and the apparitions have come out. The correlation is there. We now know it's a natural process, but it's still an enigma with respect to what the mechanism is. Lights before tremors are frequently seen, 
linking seismic events to UFOs and abductions seems far-fetched, but perhaps no stranger than the experience I had in Persinger's chamber, where he mimics natural misfirings of the brain. And going into that chamber made a big difference to me. It was as though the missing pieces came from there, the sense of anger and fear, of being pulled and manipulated by something I couldn't see. In this case, I knew it was produced by a simple change in the brain, but if that happened to me at home in bed, I would be desperate to find some explanation for it. I can even imagine that if I'd heard of alien abductions, I might wonder whether I was an abductee and seek out a therapist to find out. And no matter how careful the hypnotist is not to cue you, if you're able and willing to provide lots of details, you will, and you'll then remember those as though the events really happened. I don't think I could dismiss completely the possibility that there are real aliens actually abducting people. It seems bizarre and odd, but I suppose it could be. Have four million Americans been abducted? In the end, I don't think the poll tells us anything like that at all. It just confirms what we already knew, that most people have some strange experiences that they can't explain. I wish more research were being done into this, but until then, I think I still might keep an eye on the skies. Right, I've got my alien invasion survival card. Look at the sky. That must be the moon. There's a cloud. Yes, yeah, got clouds. Oh, it'll even help me identify seagulls. But can I see a UFO? see any UFOs yet. In case of abduction, hmm. Remain where you are. Yes, I can manage that. Give or do whatever they ask. Forget everything that happens. <laughs> yes.